This is PTV World. I am Sayyid Shabahat Ali and you are watching Fault Lines. The international debt is accumulating once again. This time, it has touched the peak it has never seen before. The world collectively owns 226 trillion US dollars to the international loan giving agencies. But wait a minute, how much is 226 trillion dollars? In year 2020, the GDP of entire world collectively together was less than 85 trillion US dollars. Yes, it was 84.54 trillion dollars to be exact. What does that mean? This means that the entire production of the world collectively together is 256% less than the money we owe to the international debt giving agencies. Many believe this to be a conspiracy for the developing countries. A deliberate plan, a ploy to bring the developing countries in the clutches of international financial institutions. But when you look at the list of the countries that owe maximum money to these international donor agencies, you'll be surprised. These are the richest nations of earth which, mo which owe maximum amount of money. And let me read the list. United States, top of the list, followed by United Kingdom, Germany, France, Japan, United Kingdom, China, Canada, and the list goes on. Our team has prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my first guest to the program. A wave of debt accumulation starting in 2010, fourth of its kind, has been underway in advanced economies, emerging market and developing economies. As the world was hit by a global health crisis and a deep recession, global debt rose by 28 percentage points to 256 percent of GDP in 2020, according to latest update of the IMF's global database. Debt dynamics, however, differ across countries. Advanced economies and China accounted for more than 90 percent of the $28 trillion debt surge in 2020. Emerging markets and low-income countries accounted for small shares of the rise in global debt around 1 to 1.2 trillion dollars each mainly due to the higher public debt. The challenges of resolving record high debt point to the urgency to act on the part of both national policymakers and the global community. National policymakers will need to improve policy frameworks to make debt sustainable as well as to broaden revenue base by strengthening business climates and institutions to support vibrant private sector growth. The costs of debt include interest payments, the possibility of debt distress, constraints that debt may impose on policy space and effectiveness, and the possible crowding out of private sector investment. Global community needs to support vaccine rollout in countries lagging, foster an open and rules-based trade and investment climate that is critical for growth engine. My first guest to the program is an expert of development economics. Uh, from Oxford University today, I have Dr. Adil Malik. He is Associate Professor of Development Ex Economics and an expert of the subject matter that we are discussing today. Uh, Dr. Adil Malik, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. We are today discussing this international debt crisis, a debt that is accumulating to a horrifying level of $226 trillion. Dr. Malik, help us to understand the basic mechanism of loan giving in the world that we live in today. I think uh, it's, it's a it's a vast subject, but I think a key distinction is to be made between countries who have to pay back their debt in their own currencies and a lot of developed countries like the United States, UK, France come in that uh, because they just simply have to print more of their notes. Um, whereas developing countries, a lot of the debt is denominated in dollars and they're short of dollars. So that structural difference is, is really important to understand. Um, and obviously, a lot of the debt structure is around the role of international financial institutions who are clearly um, in any relationship with the borrowers uh, have uh, an upper hedge. Uh, Dr. Malik, I was just running through the list of the countries that owe the maximum amount of money to these institutions and top of the list sits United States, United Kingdom, Germany, France, Japan, Netherlands. I mean, these are the most rich economies. Are these economies contributing to the donor institutions first from one hand and then taking money back from, from these uh, organizations from the other hand? Well, I mean, the way it works is that um, a lot of these countries are actually, um, they sit on the boards of the International Fund uh, in the World Bank and therefore have uh, 
disproportionate influence on these institutions. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, you know, the World Bank and the IMF both are based in Washington, and the U.S. Treasury has a very important influence on these institutions. Um, and so, there's a lot of literature in economics that have talked about the loan-giving practices of the IMF. Uh, the people like Axel Dreyer from the University of Pittsburgh, who has published a great deal about uh, the greater probability a developed country receiving IMF loan if that country is a um, partner in the Cold War, that's back in the day, or uh, more likely to participate in the war better, or has closely coordinated with uh, the P5, the large five countries in the United Nations um, in the UN Security Council resolutions. If the country has sided with uh, one of those great five powers, then it's more likely to get a loan uh, from the IMF. So there's clearly global political economy uh, that plays front and center role uh, in the way these institutions work. But there's obviously a lot of good work that these institutions also do. But by and large, we are in a situation where the debtor, um, uh, you know, those who provide debt uh, through these institutions have an inordinate influence over the fate of, uh, of developing countries. Now, you also have to keep in mind that in classic uh, debt relationship, there is always the possibility of default. If you are a firm borrowing money from US banking system, you can default. Whereas what we are finding in developing countries um, is that very few of them really have the ability to default. Um, you know, a lot of these countries clearly cannot pay their debt back. And even those who have lent money to these countries recognize that they cannot return that money, yet they become part of that debt trap. Uh, and they are never easily able to declare it. Uh, Dr. Malik, but many developing countries in the past have badly collapsed under, under these debts. And we even have today some recent examples of the countries that are now being dictated by these financial institutions, how to have their financial regulatory mechanisms operate. And then it becomes a system where the government is not actually the one that is calling the shots, but it is these international organizations. Now, my question is whether there is someone watching uh, somewhere, maybe in the regulatory uh, mechanism um, uh, institutions and deciding how much money to be given to a particular country. Because if a country is going bad in its debts, it is going to become a problem uh, for, for the institution that is lending as well. That's right. I mean, uh, for a lot of countries, um, you know, when the IMF lends money, uh, its primary objective really is to recover the money from the past debts. Uh, and that really becomes a debt trap because uh, you borrow money from the international system, you're unable to return that money, and then you need to borrow more money to return the previous money. I think an important part of this whole equation in which debt is given out, there is an underlying our relationship. Um, it is true in the context of individual lenders within societies, uh, and all great uh, you know, sort of modern descriptors had talked about the inordinate influence of the money. That clearly is a power relationship because those who lend money have really more power than those who borrow money. And in many cases, they have become enslaved. That's why one of the great sociologists of our time, David Graeber, uh, wrote in his book on debt, 1,000 Years of History, he talked about how developed countries become enslaved in that process. And therefore, the question of sovereignty becomes front and center. Because when a developing country is unable to return, it goes to the IMF. And the IMF will then dictate a lot of things. You know, how do you collect taxes? Which sectors tax um, and uh, have greater influence? Uh, Dr. Malik, when we look at the developed countries, um, and I will once again quote United States here, the recent loans that United States, that the, the trajectory of taking loans is, is just skyrocketing. They are taking more, more loans from these international organizations. And uh, does that actually uh, become a threat 
for the international financial institutions because the same amount of money could be given to many other countries that are uh, struggling more with their with their uh, basic requirements of their economy. Uh, everyone is affected, of COVID, we understand. And besides, what if United States is unable to pay back uh, in time to these institutions? Will it just create another international financial crisis as we saw in 2008 and before? Well, I mean, there is a, uh, by the way, a lot of the developed countries really um, uh, are able to print their own and they can create debt in that way. Uh, they don't have to borrow a whole lot from the national uh, financial institutions. Um, it's a bit like the government of Pakistan um, till before the autonomy of the state bank bill, actually uh, borrow money, put print notes, use the, uh, the central bank. The same thing could be done by the UK, by the United States, um, and that's an exorbitant privilege. Harry Eichel Green, a great activist in the United States, wrote a book called The Exorbitant Privilege. And that book was centered around the idea that if you are a country whose currency is the reserve currency of the world, you have an exorbitant privilege because you can really uh, print notes, you, can, you have to pay back your own currency. Now, obviously, that sort of indebtedness also depends on the ability of the world to lend it, uh, it dollars. Now, dollar is a, is a reserve currency, it's a stable currency. So all over the world, capital surplus countries are able to invest in securities. So a lot of the Arab Gulf countries, China, Japan, they buy uh, US treasury, uh, treasury. Uh, they provide low returns, with very stable returns. So the ability of the United States to incur a deficit is partly predicated on its ability to fund that deficit through those capital markets. Uh, now, clearly, there are a whole set of issues about indebtedness within the United States and the, the different problems entailed. It, but that problem is fundamentally different from a developing country, which has to borrow from abroad and uh, pay back in another currency in which they cannot issue any loans um, and therefore become more dependent on the lenders for providing foreign exchange. Also bear in mind that some of the loans are rather small. So Pakistan, for example, uh, has been negotiating uh, with the IMF just a couple of billion dollars. It's not a lot of money, you know, four, five, six billion dollars, not a lot of six money. Six billion dollars to be exact. But like Pakistan, depend on, on, on the IMF, not just for the total amount of money they provide, but the signaling device that the IMF provides to other international lenders. For example, when we go abroad and get our bond, bonds, issue our bonds, um, that is very much dependent on the IMF approving uh, program. When we get money from the uh, Asian Development Bank or the World Bank, again, uh, they require clearance from the IMF um, so I think it's that ability of global lenders to block access to other sources of finance if we don't have the health check or the health grade from them. Uh, that gives immense power, immense power to the global financial system to these set of lenders. Uh, Dr. Malik, as you very rightly pointed out, there are countries like Pakistan that are under the burden of institutions like IMF and World Bank and are at their mercy. Uh, when it comes to deciding our economic policies, most of the decisions are then taken by these institutions. As you very rightly pointed out in the last episode, for mere $6 billion, Pakistan had to accept uh, some terms and conditions which might not have been acceptable otherwise uh, to the polity of this country. But then there are countries like China that have accumulated tremendous amount of wealth in the last 25, 30 years, and still they are not willing to become a competitor of these international uh, loan giving agencies. Uh, there are countries uh, that have tried to go to China as uh, for, for rescue because they were not able to pay back timely to these international financial institutions. But China has been quite reluctant to do something out of box. What do you think can be the reason behind that? Well, China is a very conservative power. Um, obviously, it is still trying to establish uh, uh, the yuan uh, as, as the main currency, is the reserve currency. China itself uh, borrows and invests in dollars as well. So it's playing within the bounds of the international system. 
uh, it's too early for China to help other countries, right? Um, because it's very much invested in the global landscape. It will take a lot of time for China to develop institutions of alternative merit. Uh, now, clearly, Asian Infrastructure Bank was a way to provide a lending stream to other countries. Um, one difficulty uh, that China faces is that uh, China does not provide rent to elites. A lot of the Western money, whether it's debt from international institutions or foreign aid, can be seen as direct rent transfers, direct unearned income stream to ruling elites who, on the back of the, those international funds, have a permission to do whatever they wish in the country. Chinese model is very different. They don't give cash in the hands of elites. They are more engaged in project-based funding. Tradil, with this uh, said and with the uh, with the debt trap that you just rightly pointed out, uh, extended toward all these developing countries, and with COVID going on, playing at all with the economies of the, these uh, developing countries, what do you think can be the worst case scenario? Because this fourth tide of global debt is the largest one, and it, it's still ballooning more. What do you believe can be the worst case scenario for, for developing countries? Well, the worst case scenario really is uh, is sort of countries tipping over the scale and declaring bankruptcies. Um, but I'm afraid the international system that we have today does not encourage bankruptcies. They continue to lend to the bankrupt countries. Um, I think global indebtedness is, a, is is an issue that faces the whole world. The global inflationary wave that we are seeing also is a global issue. And that's where institutions like the International Monetary Fund have a role to play because they help to create global stability. Um, so I think ultimately I feel within the next four or five years, we will be able to ride through this way. Um, I think for your viewers, the key thing to remember um, uh, are these two points. The first is that the international debt system creates uh, power relationships between uh, countries that can lend money and the countries that are part of the debt trap. The second big takeaway is that this lending is just not between uh, the international financial institutions and those countries, but in fact, it's an arrangement between international financial institutions and the governing elites of these countries. Because a lot of the indebted countries, their governing elites have all the incentive to accumulate debt, pass on that debt to future generations or to future government, and then um, uh, uh, make their way through it. And so the way this system works is it binds the incentives of international lenders and local ruling elites. So a prime example of that is Egypt. Egypt's Sisi regime, General Sisi's regime, could not survive with you, without billions of dollars of money that is coming to the National Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the European Infrastructure Bank, the global uh, uh, debt markets, uh, you know, the sovereign uh, uh, debt uh, issuing, a lot of that capital inflow sustains the regime of General Sisi. So in a way, this is a dynamic between international lenders and the governing elites of, of, of the recipient states, both of whom have an incentive to partner with each other and continue that process. Thank you very much, Dr. Adil Malik, for highlighting all of this and being my guest in today's program. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break and we'll join back with the second segment of the program. Stay with us. Welcome back. The state of North Korea is shrouded with mysteries. The North Korean regime is thought to be one of the most tough regimes in the world when it comes to their people. The, this is one of the only countries in the world that does not allow internet access to its people. The country is off the international financial and diplomatic grid and does not have diplomatic relationship with almost all the countries, with very few exceptions. Recently, North Korea again caught attention of international media by testing intercontinental ballistic missiles. These missiles use a unique technology and the precision 
which with which they have hit their target has once again brought attention of the mainstream Western media. Many believe that it's a reminder for the United States of the fact that North Korea can any time pick up the weapon and maybe fire a missile toward the United States. Other believe this is not possible. Uh, the regime of North Korea is only creating more fear to avoid its bankruptcy. Our team has prepared a package. Watch the package before I bring my guest to this part of the program. The Korean Peninsula appears to be on the brink of returning to the vicious cycle of provocation and sanctions like the one in 2017. Meanwhile, North Korean Politburo convened an important meeting whereby it ordered promptly restart all temporarily suspended activities, citing U.S.-South Korea military exercises, deployment of U.S. strategic weapons and imposition of sanctions. As U.S. sought to impose further sanctions on North Korea after it conducted fourth missile test, China and Russia, however, placed to hold on the United States proposal in a closed-door United Nations Security Council meeting. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijiang emphasized that facts have proven time and again that blindly resorting to sanctions and pressure would only escalate the tension further rather than settle the peninsula issue. Nuclear-armed Pyongyang is banned from testing ballistic weapons by the UN, but denuclearization talks have been stalled since 2019 when a summit between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and then U.S. President Donald Trump collapsed over North Korea. Korea's demands for sanctions relief. The North Korean leader, who took power 10 years ago, has sought to modernize the military and it advocates that more advanced weapons are necessary for the country's self-defense. The situation. My first guest in this segment is uh, Tom O'Connor. He's senior foreign policy writer for uh, Newsweek and is joining me from New York. Tom, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, Tom, I just wrote an article that you recently wrote about the North Korean issue. How concerned you really are when it comes to the recent missile test by the uh, North Korea? Well, I think that when we look at these tests, it's important to remember that there's multiple dimensions to them. One of them, of course, is to gain attention from the international community. Another one is simply shore up its own missile capabilities. Obviously, and before these weapons ever see combat, if they ever do see combat, they need to demonstrate a good track record as far as uh, being able to perform the, the tasks they're set out to do. And of course, they're also uh, meant to sort of uh, broadcast domestic support as well. North Korea wants to show its own people that it's a strong country and has the ability to launch these sort of capabilities against uh, other countries if need be. Now, we haven't seen the sort of longer range or of course, nuclear weapons test that we have in previous years for the 2017 truce, per se. I'm um, sorry, 2018 truce, I believe. And I think that until we get to that point, we, this is more just sort of part of North Korea's classic playbook of wanting to gain attention, wanting to also be able to build its own missile capabilities and also show its own people that it is a, a, a world military power. But Tom, you just uh, mentioned 2018 and the diplomatic efforts of ice breaking between the two countries. Don't you believe that the North Korean administration tried their level best to, to break the ice with the United States? And it was rather the United States that could not capitalize on the opportunity stranded. Well, I, I certainly agree that it was an opportunity lost for both sides. Um, it's tough to know exactly where things went wrong. It did seem to be that by that February 2019 summit in Hanoi, that both sides were not speaking the same language. They were not. They did not have. Uh, equal, they did not find parity in, in, in any sort of agreement that could have been made coming out of that. So certainly an opportunity lost. I think that. Uh, North Korea certainly, and the U.S. too, would have liked to see a deal out of that. I'm not sure the Trump administration at that point was serious about wanting to go through the diplomacy of actually getting that. Um, but again, it's difficult to tell, especially from the North Korean side, what their asks were. What we know is that some sort of denuclearization for peace deal obviously never manifested. And since then, things have actually sort of unraveled. And of course, if we want to talk about lost opportunities, another lost opportunity right now is with um, the, the President, President Moon's administration in South Korea, of course, 
course, will be leaving office relatively soon. And he's done his, he, he's really went out there to try to secure some sort of end of war declaration, better inter Korean ties. If, North, if South Korea's government, then uh, if, if we see a, a more a conservative shift in elections, um, the, that enthusiasm for inter Korean relations might be lost as well. And then I think that diplomacy could take a backseat. Of course, it, it, they, there could be another push for diplomacy under that administration. We can't exclude that, but it's certainly a worrying trend right now. Tom, we'll continue this lovely conversation, but I am joined in my studio uh, by Sayyid Muhammad Ali. He is director of CAST, one of the leading think tanks based in Islamabad, a frequent guest in my program. Ali, I welcome you to my program. Thank you. Thank you. And do you just agree with what Tom said? He has uh, a lot of expectations. He had a lot of expectations from the Korean regime, but he believes that it's an opportunity that has been lost. And unfortunately, we are again moving toward the wrong direction. Uh, I think I agree with uh, the fact that uh, the diplomacy um, has not yielded uh, tangible and substantive uh, dividends uh, in terms of uh, conflict resolution and crisis management uh, in Northeast Asia. Uh, that is very important. Uh, but I think it will be more appropriate uh, if we look at uh, North Korea uh, in the larger geopolitics of Asia Pacific that the world is uh, witnessing. And uh, allow me to briefly um, uh, remind you that uh, not just uh, China, but uh, the Russian uh, growing acrimony uh, with the West in general and the US in particular uh, affects how other countries uh, react. When we look at North Korea, uh, I think there are five aspects that need, uh, deserve uh, dispassionate uh, but brief uh, assessment. Number one is the identity. North Korea has a similar um, religion, similar language and culture as South Korea, which uh, and the creation of North Korea as a consequence of the Korean War. So it was not a national liberation struggle. It was a consequence of the great power politics and uh, great powers war uh, between the US uh, and China. Secondly, a very important point that uh, is often not reflected is that uh, among the nine countries in the world which possess nuclear weapons, there are only two that are led by communist regimes. Mm -hmm. One is China, the second is North Korea. So North Korea has a special place for China, notwithstanding the diplomacy, that uh, it is one country which shares its political ideology no matter how much it is concerned or uh, uh, how much it is uh, seen with concern and skepticism in the West. The third aspect is economy. If you look at the uh, international trade of uh, a heavily sanctioned hit uh, North Korean economy, it has uh, more than five UN uh, sanctions uh, imposed on it, discouraging any military cooperation with anyone. 84% uh, of its bilateral trade is with China alone, with some part of it with India as well. So that makes it diplomatically, ideologically, uh, and economically heavily dependent on China. And that brings me to its military uh, aspect, uh, which also deserves a, a, a comprehensive assessment. 5% of the North, North Korean population is serving in the military. So that's a huge uh, you know, portion. Uh, they have uh, the fourth largest military in the world. So if you look at its size, it's perhaps the size of Potwar, but it has the fourth largest army, perhaps twice as much as Pakistan army. And uh, it has one of the largest uh, submarine fleet in the world. It has one of the uh, largest armored formations in the world, perhaps twice as many tanks as Pakistan army. So if you look at its size, it's very small economy and strong ideological linkages with China, uh, I think, uh, and, and led by a very strong, as you rightly pointed out, um, uh, an assertive and controlling uh, government, I think uh, this behavior uh, uh, is understandable, that it is not just uh, a threat to the US, but it is also uh, a language of international geopolitics in which uh, US is reminded that its primary concern is not only from China and Russia. There are other countries which uh,
can also harm and disturb the U.S. as well. Let me go back to Tom. Tom, there are 28,500 American troops stationed in, in South Korea alone. And many in this part of the world believe that it is one of the major reasons why Americans are not very serious about peace, uh, building peace between North and South Korea. South Korea on the opposite has been doing a lot since 2018 and perhaps the most concerned country uh, with this escalation again between the United States and North Korea. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think that certainly for North Korea, the presence of the U.S. troops in South Korea will always be a lasting issue. It'll always be a reminder of the Korean War. It'll be a reminder of, of the U.S. influence on, on the peninsula and the region. So I think that until that end of war declaration is realized, whether that comes just through an immediate agreement from, from the both sides, or actually three sides, including the U.S., I think that's the only way that would be able to be done, or through a more significant diplomatic process. I don't see much, uh, much loss on any Aside from doing that, seems to be a win-win situation, more or less. Of course, North Korea th wants leverage with that. They think that that's why they won't just go straight with South Korea. I think with getting some some sort of agreement, they would want the U.S. involved as well. I think South Korea has been quite urgent. Um, especially under the Moon administration with pursuing some sort of peace. At the same time, of course, they have continued their military exercises with the U.S., sometimes in a, in a scaled-down format, but yet they've continued that. The U U.S. troops have stayed, and uh, e even despite, their, their, um, under the Trump administration especially, there had been budgeting issues and disagreements. That, that alliance has never really come into question. At the same time, South Korea has also, speaking of geopolitics, of course, not uh, as enthusiastically joined the U.S. challenge to China on the world stage. We've seen that South Korea has wanted to keep working in cordial relations with China. They see China as an, as an important country in the region and, of course, the world. And they don't want to sort of ratchet up tensions the same way that some other U.S. allies and partners have. They want to keep that door open. And I think that's also important for the North Korea situation as well. I think that that, that, that strategy is smart diplomatically because it keeps South Korea as sort of, it keeps its own politics at the center, its own interests at the center of, this, of, the, of the question, which I think is very important um, dealing with both North Korea and China. And I think between China and North Korea, we've seen very interesting developments. I think early on into Kim Jong-un's uh, um, um, reign in power about 10 years ago now, there was sort of a more colder approach to China, but as China continued to rise, as U.S.-China tensions got worse, and of course, the reality we see ourselves right now on the, on the world stage, I think that, that the, the China-North Korea relationship has warmed up significantly. And I think that's also a reflection of China's just a stronger uh, position in, in Asia in general as well. So I, I think that, that we have to take into account all these geopolitical realities, especially also the fact that it's, the, it's one year on not, uh, since uh, the Eighth Party Congress, one year on since Biden took power about. And I think that North Korea as would like to see more focus from the U.S., on North Korea itself. I think that, of course, the Biden administration has had quite a lot of issues to deal with, both domestically and externally. But North Korea is, is always trying to put itself at the, at the center of the question. At the same time, I'll add, last thing is that North Korea has also not put the U.S. at the center of its own policy statements, I think, very much this past year. It's been very domestic. It's had to do with the economy. And by Kim Jong-un's admission, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough couple of years for North Korea. So when we look at North Korea's calculus and try to figure out what its strategy is, what its next moves are going to be, we have to also, again, take into that domestic factor, because that is what, of course, at the end of the day, keeps North Korea and, and keeps Kim Jong-un in power in North Korea. Thank you very much, Tom, for being a guest in my program. Ali, what do you think? Uh, how serious is the threat that uh, United States has from, from North Korea? Many people believe this is an exaggerated threat because uh, a country like uh, Korea, the North Korea, uh, that has uh, a dire economic situation in-house, will never be able to pose any direct threats to United States. It's only a tool to bargain, to get some more funding, maybe to get some more wheat. What do you think of it? Uh, I agree with you um, because uh, this hard power buildup or this strategic missile and nuclear buildup is the main element of uh, North Korean uh, national power with which it is negotiating on the world stage. It, is, uh, it has successfully drawn attention to itself. Uh, it has uh, 
um, you know, attracted a lot of interest uh, in the U.S., a lot of concern in the U.S. allies. And that is useful to China. That is useful indirectly to Russia as well, that, uh, that uh, uh, they can find distractions for the U.S. Uh, so they do look at it sympathetically, uh, even if they do not overtly and publicly endorse uh, North Korean behavior, which is seen with a lot of uh, concern in the West. Um, however, uh, I think uh, it is true that uh, this uh, military buildup is the main bargaining tool that Pyongyang has with the West. And it has worked, unfortunately. Uh, and and uh, when we look at the nuclear issue or the missile issue, I think uh, very interestingly there is some linkage with Iran as well. Because uh, uh, North Korea has been arguing with the US, with the West as well, that uh, Iran uh, is adhering to NPT. Uh, it is still party to NPT, uh, but it is still facing sanctions. It negotiated with six countries in the world, the JCPOA agreement, uh, the P5 and also Germany. And still, when the Trump administration came, it, it imposed heavy economic sanctions on Iran. So that example also uh, equips Pyongyang to uh, bargain harder with the US that what is the incentive and what is the commitment that even if they agree uh, to some sort of arms control, if not disarmament, then uh, the US will and all the future uh, administrations will adhere to these commitments and actually offer tangible and lasting economic relief. And that is the concern that the Iran nuclear deal or the U.S. departure, unilateral departure from it has raised even within the U.S. non-proliferation lobby, that this inconsistent behavior um, reduces the trust and ability of the U.S. to convince and persuade countries from building up their missile and nuclear arsenal. Uh, Ali, you just mentioned Russia maybe a couple of times, and, and you said that uh, Russia, if not taking a direct part in it, still might be happy of the fact. Uh, recently, I mean, for the last few months, there have been some serious escalations in Central Asian Republic. Uh, we, we saw problems happening in Belarus, and the fingers were pointed toward Russia. Then we saw um, Kazakhstan, um, you know, again, somewhere Russia was pointed out. And now the Ukraine's uh, tension <coughs> with, with Russia, uh, Russia is building up military and, and is trying to remind the EU of its promises to go back and to leave this Central Asian region the way it is. Now, do you believe there is something to connect between these two? Because North Korea has come out of really nowhere and tested these missiles back to back. Not only that, Kim Jong-un himself has, uh, was, was there to preside this entire thing. And um, the footages that have been released show his presence there with his sister, which means uh, maybe a lot of support from the government for all of this. So do you see a coincidence, uh, anything to connect between these two things? Um, in international politics, geography is an important factor, but not the only uh, factor. And in terms of the great power politics, uh, how this uh, gr grand chess board um, you know, plays out is very interesting. As you mentioned Russia, so if you look at three things that Russia has done recently, it is not just uh, its uh, intervention in uh, Kazakhstan, uh, because you know uh, it, there is a still, despite the breakup of Soviet Union, uh, a, a treaty, a security treaty with the Central Asian countries, which is called CSTO, uh, that uh, Moscow uh, and all the former Soviet republics have, uh, which provides them a legal framework to uh, carry out a security cooperation. Also, you would recall there was a time when uh, the British uh, Royal Navy sent a ship uh, near one of the Russian bases and, uh, you know, it was aggressively, uh, you know, returned by the, the Russian Air Force and uh, which carried out hostile sorties against it. And, and recently there have been uh, suggestions from the official quarters of Moscow that the Russians can uh, deploy its, uh, their weapon systems, their uh, naval assets, even in uh, southern Atlantic, even in, uh, uh, which basically means challenging the U.S. Monroe Doctrine. Uh, 
So it is not just that they have also uh, announced that they are going to carry out a large scale live firing exercises within the e exclusive economic zone of Ireland. So there are uh, and, and uh, recently they also announced they are going to carry out a global worldwide level naval uh, exercise uh, in which deployments will take place uh, in Atlantic, in Pacific, Mediterranean uh, uh, as well. So they are posturing very aggressively and they also notice there are some uh, chinks in the western armor. There are some issues and you would recall only yesterday very interestingly talking to at an Indian think tank. Uh, the German naval chief uh, advised uh, publicly that uh, Mr. Putin should be shown some respect by the West. And this was so politically costly that the German uh, naval chief had to resign after that. So this proves that all is not hunky-dory uh, within the ranks of the Western NATO alliance. And Russia is carefully testing the waters. It's a strategic game of chicken in which they are also uh, reasserting their, uh, their dominance in their sphere of influence, uh, their near abroad, but also testing the credibility of the US in providing in security to its allies. And that is the real question that we will thank you. witness in Ukraine. Thank you very much, Ali. This was very insightful. Ladies thank and gentlemen, you. as my guests rightly pointed out, there are great powers and aggressive postures. In, in, in this uh, Russian region as well as in North Korea. These are very sensitive times uh, for, <coughs> for the people um, around the world and these are testing times for us. Uh, let's see how the diplomacy uh, tries to cope with these serious escalations. We'll join you next week with another program. And until then, Allah Hafiz. <laughs>